Good morning. Today we are starting our next activity. So turn to your next blank page in your notebook. It should be a right hand page. Make sure the spiral and the holes are along the left side of your notebook. At the very top of the page you're writing the title for this activity which is Calculating Precision and Accuracy and write today's date as well. Next you need to copy today's focus question which is how can scientists show that their measurements are per accurate and precise. After you have your notebook set up, you need your handout that you got um, when you walked in the door. On that handout, we're going to start um, with the side that has best value and uncertainty at the top. And you're going to fold those two sides together. And then you should notice that you have a, a side that says glue this side down and then the other one looks upside down. Um, so you're going to just fold those two edges towards each other like this. So you should end up with uh, reproducible on the top and then if you flip it over it says glue this side down. So we're going to start our notes with the side that says reproducible. When scientists do an experiment or a lab activity or something like that, the goal is that their results are reproducible. So we're starting um, on the reproducible side of your worksheet and up at the definition, we're going to be filling that part in. So the definition for reproducible means uh, no matter who is doing the experiment or how many times it's done the results are repeated, which means that um, they're the same. So in order for something to be reproducible, um, you really need high levels of accuracy and precision. We saw this in our liquid volume lab where each group had done the same experiment but everyone had ended up with kind of different results. So uh, because we didn't have those high levels of accuracy and precision we saw that um, the results weren't reproducible for every single person. So in that lab, we're going to write down an example. So an example would have been um, when someone got the same results as me. So when a group the same results as Miss T. So that would have been same colors of liquid and the same amounts. A non-example of this would have been when a group got different results. different results than Miss T. So for example, just looking at a uh, six period here, um, on the left side are my results and on the right side are their results. So you would say here that um, table four was 
reproducible. And then if you look here at table five, you'll see that they have some of the same colors, but they're not in the right order and uh, they don't have the same amount. So that would have been not reproducible. Here at table six, um, they ended up forgetting that they were supposed to save the results. So let's jump to table three. Um, table three, you can see that they have the same colors and the same amount. So table three would have had reproducible results. Uh, table two, they ended up with some of the same colors again, but different amounts and they're missing a purple, so that would have not been reproducible. And then uh, for table one, they had again some of the same colors, but they were missing one and they had different amounts, so that would have been not reproducible. If you need to pause the video at all to finish your notes, please do so. And we are going to move on to the next spot. If you take the side that says reproducible and you flip it down, we're starting here where it says trial. Uh, trials in science has to do with uh, going through the steps um, you know the or procedures. Um, of an experiment or a lab activity um, one time. So one trial would be going through the steps or procedures of the lab once. And so we um, usually want to do repeated trials. So repeated trials um, improve accuracy. The more times you do it, the more likely it is that you've gotten closer to the result that you want. Kind of think about it like on your grade. You wouldn't want just one assignment to determine your whole grade for the year. You want more um, so that you have more opportunities to really reflect what you know. Um, for our class, we're always going to do a minimum of three. You can do more if you can, um, but we're always going to do a minimum of three. There's no equation for trials, um, so you can skip that part. And then an example, what you would see is like a, a data table. And on the side it would have like trial. And the side would have um, time, let's say, in seconds. And you would see it says trial one, two, trial three like that. The next thing that's important in order for us to um, work towards our reproducibility um, has to do with outliers. Outliers are uh, a measured value that's very different. from the other values that you've collected, but the number would be just completely different than everything else that you, that you have. Um, so I'll start with an example just to make that easier to see. So I'm going to create my little data table again, and then I'm going to do my trial. And um, let's do time again and seconds. And let's say for trial one, two, three, you can fit four trials. So let's say the times are like 11, 12, and you get 29 and 11. Uh, the outlier would be the 29. Um, up in the facts, I want you to always uh, check your data during your lab or activity. Um, that just makes it easy if you notice that you have a data point that would be an outlier, you can get rid of it and then you still would have the correct number of trials that you need instead of having to get rid of it um, later. Outliers are always removed, so um, 
outliers are removed from data. So today we're talking about you know how scientists show their measurements are accurate and precise. So if you have an outlier, you're going to want to remove it from your data before you do any calculations so that your reported numbers are you know as accurate and precise as you can get. Outliers don't have an equation, so we're going to mark that one off. And then pause the video if you need to. When you're ready, we're going to open it up. So I'm going to start on the top left side where it has best value. Best value um, might be a new term the way that it's written here, but um, it's probably not actually new to you. Um, the best value is the average. Average of a set of data. And it's a number that represents a set of numbers. It's uh, also known as a mean. You might have called it that in uh, math class. You will see it written to sometimes as BV, so I'm going to add that here. Best value. Best value does have an equation. Um, you guys have probably seen this before. You would add up all the numbers that you have for an experiment. Let's say we have three trials, so I would add the data from trial one, trial two, and trial three, and then I would divide by the number of trials that I have. So that would be the equation. If you have six trials, you would add all six trials across the top, and then you would uh, divide your number by six. Up in the facts, we're going to put that you always need to do multiple trials. Then calculate the best value for reporting. And I could kind of compare this to your grades again. You know, you do, let's say, 100 assignments for science for the year, and instead of reporting your grade as your individual grade for each of those assignments, uh, we calculate an average, and your average is the grade that's reported. A best value is an estimate for the true value of a set of data. When scientists perform an experiment to measure a quantity, they never really obtain a true or exact value. So there's always a little bit of uncertainty associated with that measurement. So scientists would choose to report a best value and not say, you know, it's an exact value for the measurement. But the goal of making good measurements is to reduce the amount of uncertainty so that the best value is as close to the true value as possible. Uh, to do this, we have to design our experiment procedures really well and make sure that we follow them carefully. Um, and then each measurement of the quantity gives you a value that could be a little bit higher or a little bit lower than the true value. So it's usually common to make a lot of measurements, like I'm saying here with our multiple trials, and then to calculate the average. And then the average that's reported is considered the best value. All right, so for our example for best value, what I want you to think of is if I had three trials, and I had 38 seconds, 42 seconds, 42 seconds, and let's say 40 seconds. How many trials would I have done? Four. So what number would I divide by? Four. Yeah, so there's seconds. Anytime we report a number, we're going to report its 
unit of measurement with it. So 42 seconds, 42 seconds, it kind of got smushed, 40 seconds. And if I divide it by four, my answer is going to be 40.5 seconds. Then I don't know how you do in math class, but I usually like to put a box around the answer to kind of separate it from the rest of the numbers. The next thing we're gonna look at is uncertainty. So um, because there's always a little bit of variation in our numbers, we have to figure out a way to basically report the error to say like, we know we're wrong and this is about how wrong we are. So I'm starting with the definition. The definition is the variability or error in a set of measurements or data. So on the front side, we had talked about outliers. So before you do the best value in the uncertainty, you would have always removed your outliers first. And the equation that you use for uncertainty is your highest value. And then you subtract your lowest value. And then you divide by two. So it's a little bit like the range, but then we divide by two. Up in the facts, we're gonna put that there will always be some variation So we have to say how much. How much variation there is. Lower numbers for your uncertainty. Mean more accurate and whatever value you get for your uncertainty actually tells you by how much the true value may be higher or lower than your best value or your average I'm gonna do an example based on the same set of data that I put down for best value so the highest number there is a 42. So I'm gonna do 42 seconds minus the lowest value, which is 38 seconds, and then divide it by two. So my best, and not my best answer, <laughs> the answer would be four seconds divided by two, or two seconds. Put a box around it as it's my answer. So the next term we're gonna talk about is the true value, which actually combines the best value and uncertainty. So the true value is uh, of a set of data is the acceptable range, the acceptable range of data in an experiment's results. And that would include, you know, an experiment like rolling a ball and measuring how long it takes it to go somewhere or the lab that we did with the colors, okay? So the acceptable range of data. The true value is um, determined by looking at both the best value and the uncertainty. So for the equation, the way that it's usually written is like this best value, BV, plus or minus uncertainty.
the best value is used to describe precision. So remember again, the lower your uncertainty, the more accurate your data is. And then for your true value, the smaller your range is, it gets you closer to your true value. So it can actually show you um, how precise your uh, measurements are. So I'm going to add that. So a smaller true value range means it's more precise. Usually if you're going to write down an example of what the true value is, it's kind of written like a sentence. So you would start it with the true value is, and I'm going to use the same examples that we were just working with. So in the best value we had for the example right above, we said it was 40.5 seconds. So I'd write 40.5 seconds. And then I'd write plus or minus the uncertainty we calculated, which was two seconds. So the true value is 40.5 seconds plus or minus two seconds. The other way that we could write it is the true value is probably, and remember we have to use probably because we have uncertainty, probably between, and then I have to do math. So I would do the best value minus the uncertainty, which would be 38.5 seconds. And then I use the word and, and then I'd have to do the plus. So that would be 42.5 seconds. So this is my best value minus uncertainty, and then my best value plus the uncertainty. So the last thing we're going to look at is percent error. I'm going to start up at the top with the definition. If you guys did your accuracy and precision homework that was in your measurement packet, you already had a little practice with this. So the definition is the percent difference between a measured value and the actual value. The percent difference between a measured value and the actual value. So the equation looks like this. Actual value minus the measured value. And then we have to divide it by the actual value. And because we're going for a percentage, you have to multiply it by 100. So up at the top for your facts, Percent value is a way to express, which means to show the amount of error and uncertainty together. And if you think about it for the color lab, we didn't actually have data that was numbers because most people didn't measure their final volumes. But if you had measured your final volumes, we would have been able to compare them and we would have been able to determine a amount of error, so a percent of error based on that. 
The percent error can only be calculated if you know the actual value. So if I try to estimate the number of stars and then try to like correct my number of my estimate, I couldn't do that because we don't actually know the actual value of the number of stars. I'm going to copy the example that was on the worksheet that you guys did. And it says, while doing a lab, a student found the density of a piece of pure aluminum to be 2.85 grams per centimeters cubed. The accepted value for the density of aluminum is 2.7 grams per centimeters cubed. What was the student's percent error? So the actual value of the density of aluminum is 2.7 grams. And then you do slash CM3. then I'd have to subtract the number that the student got, which was 2.85 grams per centimeters cubed. Take that number and divide it by the actual number. And then remember, I have to multiply by 100. So then the answer ends up being 5.6% error. We won't always be able to calculate the percent error, but when we have the ability to do it, we will do it so that we are able to show how right we are, or how wrong we are. In your notebook, you're gonna fold this back up, and then the side that says glue this side down, you are going to glue down into your notebook.